Hey guys, uh, welcome back to chapter nine's lecture on periodic properties of the elements. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at uh, electrons that we looked in last chapter, and now we're going to start applying it to elements, and then how we can start using those electrons and, and different properties of these elements to actually look at your periodic table. There, there's so much information found in the periodic table um, that it's almost a disservice to you guys uh, presenting it this late into the semester as opposed to really starting off with it because there, it answers a lot of the questions that we might have uh, when we talk about ionic compounds, when we talk about covalent compounds and naming things and doing all this. Uh, it's very important about the periodic table. So uh, this is uh, Mendeleev, right? And Mendeleev was able to test the patterns and he saw patterns amongst the elements. If you want a good book uh, just to read on your own time about the periodic table, uh, there's a book called The Disappearing Spoon. Um, and it's how we discovered, how scientists discovered the many elements uh, of the periodic table. Mendeleev is credited with creating the first periodic table. Um, obviously, at his time, when he did it in the 1800s, there weren't many elements discovered. So what he did was he would be able to use the, what he knew to make predictions about different uh, elements that would then be found, be discovered, and put into the periodic table. Um, and so just here's a, here's a, just a couple predictions that he made uh, about aluminum, he called eco aluminum and eco silicon, um, but really they're germanium and gallium. And when they were discovered, the predictions that he was able to make just based on periodic uh, tendencies, and, and, and we'll talk about periodicity, right? The, the idea that there are periods, that, that things in the column are very similar. Um, he was able to use that to predict things like density, melting point, formulation of when it reacts with oxygen, when it reacts with a, with a halogen. And that's really, that's, that's really cool that he's able to do that. We're going to look in this chapter why he was able to do that. And so just to start off with, you know, we, we, we talked about last time that electrons occupy orbitals in particular ways, right? This is known as an electron configuration, right? And, and in an electron configuration, it shows the particular orbitals and the electrons that then occupy those orbitals for that atom. You know, one of the things that we have to think about is for any atom, there is something known as the ground state. This is the lowest energy state. This is the state with which all of the elements want to be. They want to be in their ground state where they have their, their you know, just replica uh, or, or just their, their full assortment of electrons um, and their very low energy. Um, we're going to look at uh, uh, these orbitals. You know, we, we looked at a table at, in part three of chapter seven. Um, and so we're going to start using that, that, that table a little bit to, to help describe uh, how to write these uh, electrons. We'll come back to this electron configuration as we compare it to another way we can draw these. So there's, there's the electron configuration. As you see, it is just uh, the, 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 the elemental symbol. So in, in the previous slide, it was hydrogen H. Hydrogen only has one electron. Here we're looking at helium has two electrons. Uh, and in the electron configuration, it's just the elemental symbol. And then we have the N, right, which is the, the level of energy, the size, right? So one. And then we put the shape or the orbital that it's filling, S. And then we put how many electrons are there uh, as a, as a uh, script. Uh, as a superscript. And so it's 1s2. The s orbitals what that we'll see can only have two electrons. They can't have more than two. P can have up to six, but no more than six. And then D can have up to 10. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about how we know uh, that uh, in a second. And so um, let's look at this, this thing called the orbital diagram. The orbital diagram actually shows the electrons and where they are, right? It gives the same information as your electron configuration. You only are able to represent them as arrows. So it's a slightly little bit more um, detail. And so let's go ahead and, and let's look at the board for an example of why like heliums looks the way that it does. All right, so on the, as you're looking at it on the right side of the board or on the left side of the board, um, we have some numbers. Remember the quantum numbers from, um, don't worry about the, the equations and stuff in the middle. We'll get there uh, in the next couple slides. But 
um, if you remember the uh, the quantum numbers, right? We have n, which was the principal, which was the principal. It talks about the energy and the size. This talks about the shape. This talks uh, about just the numbers, right? So for s, it's zero. For p, it's minus one, zero, and plus one. Um, and so let's go ahead and look at helium. So the so there's helium. There's two electrons. We and, and we'll talk about how we fill these. We talk about how we'll, we'll talk about how we can do this orbital diagram. But for now, we know that there's two electrons. Okay. So let's look at these electrons in the view of their quantum numbers. So the n for these electrons would be this number right here. So the n, and I'll just do a, electron a and electron b. Oh, now you can't see my a and b. There we go. So we have electron a and electron b. So for electron a, the n is number one. For electron b, the n, is, you're right, is also number one. It's in the same orbital. The l, since it's an s, is zero for both of them because they're the same. The ML, right, remember S is just zero. Now, there is something on the slide that, that, we, that I just kind of skipped over because I wanted to cover it here. It's known as Pauli's exclusion principle. And what Pauli's exclusion principle states is that two electrons cannot have the same uh, quantum numbers, right? They cannot have four of the same quantum numbers. So we have one, one, zero, 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 zero. These have three. So then what we do is we point one of the arrows up and we put uh, another arrow down. And what that denotes is what's known as spin. So we briefly brought up spin in the, in the end of chapter seven. But what happens is one is positive a half and the other one is negative a half. These two numbers are not the same. Therefore, Pauli's exclusion principle is kept. Right and and is is still being uh, is still there right is, is that these two electrons for helium are don't have the same four quantum numbers now if I were to give you these four quantum numbers or four quantum numbers you should then be able to go to an orbital diagram and tell me where that electron uh, is and so. Um, just that's how much information these quantum numbers uh, actually give to us. So let's go ahead. Let's come back to the PowerPoint. All right. Ah, here I am. All right. So that that's how how we diagram um, those. Now, within sublevel, right? Because we have we're, we're going to talk about how these orbital diagrams are laid out. And one of the things that we need to look at is, is, is energy, right? Because that's, that's the way they're organized is all due to the energy within the, the orbitals, within the, the space around the, the nucleus. And so empty orbitals have the same energy level. This is known as degenerate, right? So let's look at, you know, we looked at helium, right? Helium has a full 1s. Well, let's say we looked at the 2s orbital. Or, or let's look at the 2p orbital of helium, right? And you might think, Dr. Bishop, that doesn't have a 2p orbital. You're right. They're empty, right? There's nothing in them. And so uh, all, if, if there's an orbital with no electrons in it, they are all of the same energy uh, level. And so that's really uh, an interesting thing because we're going to talk about then how we fill them. Uh, and once we start filling orbitals, that is when we start to change uh, the energy. Filled orbital levels have varied energy levels, right? It's not until they get filled until they start having energy. And there are three key concepts associated with the or orbitals. And we're going to look at these concepts. I would like you to just be aware of these concepts. We might not necessarily be calculating the math from these concepts, but at least we should know them. One is the Coulomb's law. We'll cover that in the next slide. And then in, in two slides, we'll, we'll cover shielding and what that means and then penetration. And what we'll do is, is when we talk about these, Coulomb's Law, Shielding, and Penetration, we're able to then make a better orbital map uh, and, and how to fill up these electrons based on their energy. So Coulomb's Law shows the attractions and repulsions between charged particles. So magnitude of the potential energy, right? Because we're talking about potential energy, not necessarily kinetic energy, depends inversely, 
on the separation between charged particles. So the, the closer two charged particles are, the higher the energy, the potential energy those particles have, okay? So for like charges, right, for like charges, what happens if you take a, a positive pole of a magnet and you stick it right next to a positive pole of a magnet? You're right, they repulse. The energy is positive, right? That is positive energy, and that's not what we want. We want negative energy, right? We, because negative energy is energy given off. Um, it's useful energy. And so plus and plus make a positive energy. Now, what would happen to that energy if we started to have the greater distance? Exactly, it would decrease. I'm gonna show you this, uh, a, an equation for this uh, in a minute. We won't have to use it necessarily for math, but it helps kind of describe the concepts. For opposite charges, right, E is negative, right, because you have a positive charge and a negative charge, uh, and becomes more negative, which means there's a more energy release as the particles get closer together. And then the magnitude of the interaction between charged particles is dependent on the charge, right? So if you had a plus one and a plus and a minus one, and they're of the same distance apart, and then you have a plus two and a minus two, that's gonna be four times more uh, energy release. So let's go ahead and let's look at that, an example of this. And we see that with the top equation. So the top equation is what's known as Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is, is showing us that energy is equal to one divided by four pi and then this sigma, uh, actually it's an epsilon, excuse me, epsilon naught, uh, which is a constant, which is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. If we were to look at this number right here, this whole number is a constant right? Because pi is a number, four is a constant, you know, pi is a constant, this is a constant. So this doesn't change. So we're not going to really focus on this, but we're going to focus on this. Q1 and Q2 and R, right? So we said the energy is inversely related to the distance between particles. And so energy is inversely related to the radius or, or the distance between two particles. And so what happens is if we get closer together, so this number goes down, we said that the energy then is going to go up. There's going to be more energy. We talked about charges, right? So it's charge one times charge two. If a like times a like, whether it's a negative times a negative or a positive times a positive will always give you a positive number, right? And so then this will be positive, right? And, and that's not what we want. We want negative, which is why plus times a minus gives us a minus number. And obviously, the, the, the more charges that we have, the bigger the charges, the bigger the energy, right? The more potential energy that we would have. And so this is just taking what we had said in words, putting it into an equation. And so when we're on an exam, and let's say I were to ask you, you have three different sets of particles. They're all spaced relatively the same. Let's say 100 picometers. And one of them was plus one, minus one. One of them was plus one, plus one. The other one was minus two, plus one. Which one would have the highest potential energy? If you said the one, Dr. Bishop, the one that has the, the minus two plus one, you are correct, right? Because it's the same distance. There's no you know, changing of the distances. There's just changing of the charges. And that would change the amount of, uh, of potential energy that that system would have. So let's look at the other one. The other one is shielding. Right, shielding is where an electron, an electron does not experience the full effect of the nuclear charge. Right, and so there are some, ex, you know, some uh, electrons that are on the outside that aren't experiencing the full uh, charge uh, from the nucleus. And here we can look at this example when we look at the shielding. We can calculate what's known as Z effective, Z, and then subscript EFF. Let's go ahead. I'm going to leave the screen kind of small. Um, no, no, I'm not. Z-E-F-F, -F, right? And what that's going to equal is the, the charge of the nucleus, which is always going to be positive, right? Because that's where the protons are, minus the charge of the electron. So then we would just put, or, or plus the charge of the electrons, because that's always going to be a negative. I just write minus. Now, the charge of the electrons are those inner core electrons. We're going to talk about the difference between inner electrons and outer electrons and how we can tell which is which. But, but suffice it to say, let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint. 
And so what we can see is that in this, that we're looking at lithium, I believe, which is a three. So lithium has three electrons. Lithium has three protons. And so we know that there's a three plus charge in the nucleus. Well, in between the nucleus and this one electron that's kind of floating out in space are two electrons. These two electrons are closer to the nucleus. That's going to be the charge of the nucleus. So instead of that experience, that lone electron on the outside experiencing a plus three charge from the electron or from the nucleus, excuse me, it's being shielded by its two buddies. And so it's only feeling a plus one. We're going to see that that's going to be really easy for that lithium to lose that electron. So then what happens is because of that, because that electron is like, I don't like being out here in the space, right? Only feeling a plus one. I want to feel the full force of the, the, the nucleus. It is going to then do what's known as penetration, where the outer electrons can start to push into uh, lower levels, uh, into those levels of inner electrons. And so what we're going to find is we need these three things to help us understand this, right? That we can graph sublevels based on their energy levels. So you have 1s at the bottom. You have 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 4p, 3d. And so what you can see is, wait, this 4s comes in between this 3d and this 3p. Exactly, because of penetration and because of shielding. You know, and then you have 4P, 5S, 4D, right? And then as you get closer up, there's a couple things that we can notice. One is that the energy level starts to squish, right? That there's not much energy difference between a 3D and a 4P orbital. We can also see, right, that the fourth and the fifth levels are starting to penetrate into each other, right? And, and so that there's this kind of conglomeration uh, of these different uh, levels, these different orbitals. And so... What can we do with this? And, and so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start diagramming uh, elect, uh, elements. Yay, diagramming elements. I love diagramming elements. All right, so let's talk about filling orbitals. There are rules about filling orbitals. First rule is known as the off-ball principle. You do need to know these just again because they're rules that we need to use to fill orbitals. The off-ball principle says you always fill from the lowest level and you work your way up, right? You never work, start at the top and work way down. You always start at the lowest level. You always start at 1S and then you go on from there. When filling degenerate orbitals, right? So what I mean by degenerate, remember, degenerate orbitals were those that are empty um, or those that are empty. Uh, so that you have the three P ones. If they're empty, they're degenerate. You always start filling them singly with parallel spins and then you can start fill, then you can just go back and, and fill in as needed. Each orbital receives two electrons. It cannot have more than two electrons, um, or each box, each line can only have two electrons. So let's go ahead and go to the board for the last few minutes. And we are going to go to see how we can actually do this. Again, practice, uh, practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect. And so this is uh, going to be, you know, Interesting. There are different ways that some people do orbital diagrams. This is the way that I am expecting you guys to do it. So let's go ahead and erase all this. Let's look at an example. Actually, before I look at you, give you guys an example for the electron configuration. So remember, that's just where you write out the 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 in in list form. Oops. In list form, you write out the different orbitals. Here is the order. And this will help you do the orbital diagrams as well. So you have 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s. We probably won't get out to, oops, you can't even see that. We probably won't get out to 6S, uh, but I just want to give it to you. And so let's think about this. So there's two total electrons in, a, in an S. There is four total electrons in a P. There is 10 total electrons uh, in a D. And then there is, we don't talk about Fs, uh, 
So that's okay. All right. So, and how do we know how many electrons? So number electrons in orbital is going to be 2n plus 2. Right? So remember, s, or 2l, sorry, 2l plus 2. And so s is 0, so 0 plus 2 is 2. P is 1, 2 plus 2 is 4. D is 2, sorry, not 10, 6. F is 10. Um, and then F would be 10. So number of electrons in orbitals. So let's talk about uh, neon, right? So we're gonna do neon in a couple different ways. Neon is gonna be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, right? Because it's a, it's a noble gas. So everything is going to be filled. How do I know how many electrons something has? Right, how do I know neon has 10 electrons? Exactly, we can go to the periodic table of elements and we can look and we can see how many protons something has because that's going to equal the number of electrons. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say this, this video is going to go maybe a little bit on the longer side. Uh, I'm going to apologize for that, but but I want to kind of go through all of this because there is a nat somewhat natural break um, uh, between a couple different concepts after this. And so let's go and do the orbital diagram. So neon, so we have 1s, right? So remember, we start at the bottom. We have 2s, and then we have 2p. So we can start filling, right? We start filling degenerates with parallel, and then we can go back and fill in. So there's neons. Let's go ahead and look at um, magnesium. Okay, so there's neon. I'm gonna leave this part of neon up. And so what I want you guys to do is I'm gonna do this for neon. I would like you guys to do the orbital diagram of neon, okay? So go ahead and do the orbital diagram of neon. I'm going to show you a simpler way to write an electron configuration. This is known as the noble gas configuration, right? And so a noble gas configuration, let's look at magnesium. I chose magnesium for a reason. What does this part of magnesium look like? Exactly, it looks the same as neon. So the way we can simplify this is that the inner electrons of magnesium look like neon. And then there just happens to be two on the outer edges. So there's three S2 left that aren't the inner core uh, electrons. So we could calculate shielding for, for those two electrons if we wanted to. So let's, so, so we're gonna end the video here. If you have any questions about electron configurations or orbital diagrams, we'll just have to know the difference. Whenever you see configuration, you know it's just the list, like we have there on the board right now. If it's an electron, if it's an orbital diagram, then you know it's the arrows. And so we'll just have to keep those two uh, separated. Uh, if you will. So in, in part one, so we're finished with part one. In part two, we're going to finish up talking about different electrons, how we can use the periodic table to our advantage uh, in filling these things out. And then we'll talk about some trends uh, of the periodic table.